Good evening. <clears throat> this is Frank Knight. How frequently we hear the phrase, this is the world's finest, and it's often very confusing. But there should never be any confusion regarding the quality of the different makes of watches. Competitions are open to any manufacturer who feels that his watches have a chance to win. And you can just look at the record. Now here is the Longines record. At World's Fairs and International Expositions, among the fine watches of the world, Longines alone has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medal awards. These grand prizes and gold medals were awarded by impartial juries of experts. And now take the matter of observatory accuracy competitions. The records show that year after year, Longines watches have been a consistent winner of first prizes and special honors from 1878 right up to this very day. Have all these competitions and public honors proved Longines to be the world's finest? Longines prefers to say, the world's most honored. And if you wish to own or give the world's finest, your choice might very well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. The Longines chronoscope each week looks for the truth in the important issues of the hour. And here to discuss these issues are our co-editors, Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, a political economist of respected judgment and contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Ambassador Ernest A. Gross, U Deputy United States Representative to the United Nations. In this spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion, the opinions are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Gross, you are uh, deputy to Ambassador Austin, I believe, at the UN. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm the deputy chief of the United States mission to the UN. And you are, of course, a defender of uh, present State Department policy. As I understand them, I defend them, and I think that uh, they're worthy of defense. You, uh, you then believe, of course, that the State Department has a policy. I believe that the State Department has a policy. I believe that the Congress has a policy. And I think that on the whole, the two policies make one. And I think they're the same. Well, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to get to the ceasefire negotiations. Now, these negotiations, since the original Malik speech, have been going on for something like six weeks and about 19 meetings. Do you think that the uh, Chinese communists are stalling in order to get, gain time? I think that uh, it's impossible to say whether they're stalling or not. I think that uh, one of the things we must be prepared for and prepared for inside our minds and our consciences is that one of their primary purposes may be to stall and to bluff and to haggle and to wear out the free world, to divide us and to confuse us. I think that we have to be prepared for that. Well then, haven't we, uh, aren't we in danger of losing morale of our fighting forces by continuing these negotiations ourselves, if that's what they're doing? Well, I think that the test of strength between the communists and the free world uh, involves the ability to last and to stick it out. And I think that we have to be ready for the kind of tactics which the communists have used on many occasions, those of us who have been subjected to their stalling and haggling tactics, remember well the many, uh, very many hours and days and weeks that have been spent fruitlessly in the attempt to find a peace treaty for Austria. They pursued the same course uh, in connection with the discussions in Paris of the deputy foreign ministers. That's their tactic. Well, if these negotiations are broken off now, won't we be at a great disadvantage as a result <laughs> of them and a lowered morale of our men and a poss possibly a great buildup of the push there in Korea? I don't think that uh, it would be uh, quite appropriate to uh, predict uh, how they will turn out, and I, I certainly would not uh, want to speculate. Uh, General Ridgway and Admiral Joy have a terrific job, and they're doing it in a terrific way. I think that the discussions will undoubtedly continue. I think that uh, the thing we have to be most on our guard against is to prevent ourselves from being demoralized and disunited by a long continuation but we'll stick it out. 
You made a very courageous speech uh, the other day about the participation of our allies, uh, urging further participation. Uh, would you care to elaborate on that now? No, I think that, uh, that the, our allies um, have uh, made a contribution, a substantial contribution, but I think to be, we must all be frank about it. I don't think that the contribution which have been made by all UN members uh, is uh, commensurate with their abilities uh, and uh, taking into account their commitments elsewhere, and I do not think the United Nations uh, has reason to uh, feel that a sufficient contribution has yet been made. We hope and expect that greater contributions will be made by those able to make them. Mr. Ambassador, I happen to be one of those Americans who doesn't find it too difficult to restrain my enthusiasm for the UN. <laughs> and uh, I know that a great many people in a country are a little bit disappointed and disillusioned over that contribution. Now, uh, are you among those people? Are you disappointed that, that the contribution has been made by our reluctant allies? <coughs> I think that we who uh, deal with these matters uh, constantly in the UN uh, uh, develop uh, perhaps a, a broad perspective. Uh, uh, we, we feel that we're entitled to the judgment that uh, uh, many of our allies have made contributions which for them considering their commitments elsewhere are very substantial contributions, even though they don't compare the, numerically with if ours. If the fighting goes on, sir, uh, do you think that uh, there's reason to expect that we'll get uh, greater contributions from these allies? We hope that to get greater contribution from our, uh, from our allies, whether the fighting continues or not. Uh, we think this, uh, a this effort in Korea is a collective action and should have a very broad contribution from the world over. Well, and Mr. Ambassador, we came in, uh, when we went into this, we were going in ostensibly on behalf of the United Nations, and we have so far mm -hmm. furnished about 90% of the troops. Of the non-Korean forces. Of the non-Korean forces, that is right. So that while this is called a collective action, collective security, and in the name of the United Nations, it really comes down more or less to our carrying the load, doesn't it? Uh, in terms of the manpower that's been put in, of course, as you know, the 16 uh, nations have made contributions of manpower, and uh, some other, I think, 35 or 40 have made contributions of material. Now, as I said before, we think there's plenty of room for additional contribution. And I think that none of us can be satisfied until, I'm talking about the United Nations generally, until there has been a broader contribution from many more countries than have contributed up to this point. But I think that it would be unfair to say that this has not been and is not now a collective effort. It is. And I think that uh, one of the things that perhaps uh, undoubtedly has brought uh, the uh, communists into negotiation is not merely the military position, but the realization that there has been a collective effort underway. Yes, Mr. Ambassador, to get away from the Korean problem and to get down to these disillusionments we may have suffered over, over the United Nations, one of the things that people are critical about is that the United Nations seems to be almost wholly concerned now with arraying force against our, our enemies. Now, have you let down your more idealistic supporters in doing that? Well, I think not, Mr. Huey. I, I think that, uh, that uh, it would be fair to say that uh, the uh, United Nations is actively concerned with a great many problems which affect morals and moral yeah. unity and well-being. We have large uh, economic programs. We have solidly supported the human rights work. And we are busily at work now in disputes within the free world itself. But do you have a dynamic policy? Are you, are you opposing our enemy with, with anything that's dynamic? Well, I think so far as the Soviet Union is concerned, uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, it's in your question, if I understand it, as to whether we are being uh, lulled into a sort of a negative uh, feeling that uh, uh, all we have to do is to contain or hold uh, our uh, potential enemy, uh, the enemy that's uh, back of the fighting in Korea now. I do not think that the United Nations is a negative thing. I think that the Charter of the United Nations 
is in a real sense a charter of liberation and not a mere charter of containment, if I may use that expression. Well, what specifically are we doing in that direction behind the Iron Curtain? Well, in the first place, uh, where there are very many people, as there are now in the slave world, in the Soviet-dominated portion of the world, uh, and within communist China, great many, a great many people whose human aspirations are being suppressed, whose national aspirations are being uh, suppressed, a great explosive forces build up. The Charter, I think, is one of the instruments and one of the things that represents for them a possible point of liberation that expresses their ideas, that expresses their aspirations. And I think by our support of the Charter, we are supporting the things they want. Well, I think we am afraid we only have time for one more question or so. I noticed that you, the other day, in your speech, uh, supported land reform abroad. Now that has seemed to many of us dubious because uh, land reform mm -hmm. has been one of the uh, slogans of the communists and it has meant an undermining of the principle of private property. So I'm wondering uh, what that mean, would mean in actual application. Well we mean by land reform, of course, uh, I think we mean uh, not uh, expropriating land, taking it from the hands of the peasants and sweeping it into the arms of the state. We mean reforms which really give to the farmers and the farmers' families the means of subsistence. I'm sorry, Mr. Ambassador. I believe that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us this evening. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our guest was Ambassador Ernest A. Gross, Deputy United States Representative to the United Nations. The factory whistle is a souvenir of years gone by when the distinction of owning a fine watch was restricted to very few people. Today you go to work or turn on your television according to your own individual watch. Now if you own a Longines watch you know how smoothly these fine dependable timepieces permit you to organize your day-to-day -day activities. We who make Longines watches know how special engineering standards permit us to determine in advance that every Longines watch is an outstanding Longines watch. We speak from solid experience when we say that a Longines watch will keep good time for a long, long time. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 Gold Medal Awards, and highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Sold and serviced by more than 4,000 leading jewelers from coast to coast, who proudly display the emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Next week at this same time, over the CBS television network, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company will again present the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the vital issues of the hour. This is Frank Knight speaking for Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, both products of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is the CBS Television Network.